Hello makers and welcome to Sheer Stitchery. I'm Katherine Harris and this week I wanted to share with you a pattern review as well as a sew along for the Lola blouse and dress from Forget Me Not Patterns. So let's get into it. Now before I get into the sew along, I thought I would talk a little bit about the pattern itself. Now this pattern is an option of a blouse as well as a dress pattern. It has a slight A-line shape to it and is meant to be more loose fitting than tight fitting. Now this has a size range of 28 through 48 and that means a bust measurement range of 28 and a half inches through to 48 and a half inches a waist measurement of 21 and a half inches through to 41 and a half inches and a hip measurement of 32 and a half inches through to 52 and a half inches. Now, if you are outside of that size range, fret not because it has been drafted with a lot of ease, it shouldn't matter terribly much. But if you are concerned with having more of a drapey billowy feel to this top, it is very simply added to add on any additional inches on the pattern because it is drafted in a nice simple way that you can really add that on and there are no fiddly pieces to worry about. Now the Lola is a loose fitting blouse or dress and you can opt to on the dress version have it a loose fitted loose fitting tunic style or cinch it in with the optional belt tie to really define that waist. Now the nice thing about this is the way in which it is drafted it doesn't create a lot of volume around the hips but it still provides enough ease for it to be incredibly comfortable making this very flattering on a multitude of different body styles. Now in terms of how it is drafted, it is drafted with a grown on sleeve, also known as a kimono sleeve, and it has a yoke in the back that attaches to an inverted box pleat in the back, creating additional ease of movement at that shoulder area. You have a number of different neckline options to choose from as well as having the option of having a mini ruffle along the back yoke hem, which of course I had to choose because it is oh so darn cute. Now, in terms of how you put it on, you just pop it on over your head. So you don't have to worry about any fiddly fastenings with buttons, zips, or even ties like there are in other garments. One thing I am very excited about is a sleeve add-on for a flounce option on this sleeve. So this pattern originally would have ended here where my grown on sleeve ends, but with the flounce option, you have this option of having this ruffled flounce, which I think really makes a statement in this blouse and dress and it is the option that I chose to do. So the sew along will also include this new expansion. And I decided to do mine in a lightweight crinkle crepe de chine. So it is super airy and flowy and it just feels like a cloud when you're wearing it. So it's oh so comfortable. So let's get on to that tutorial. So we're going to start with step one, stay stitching, and step two, the neckline for the boat neck version. So I'm doing the scoop neck, so I'm going to stay stitch both the front and back neck edges. Next is step three, the bust starts. And so the first thing you're going to do is you're going to transfer those pattern markings to create that dart. And I just like to use my quilting ruler and a water soluble marker to trace out those dart legs. And once you have that nicely traced on the wrong side of your fabric, you are then going to place your fabric right sides together. I like to place a pin in the tip of the dart so that I make sure that I have my dart going straight. And then I match up the two sides of the dart leg 
And you want to make sure that your pins are pointing um, the sharp end towards the edge of your fabric because you're going to start at the bottom of the dart along the edge here. And I am just placing my pins in and I'm checking on the other side to make sure that my line matches up exactly with that line I drew for the other end of the dart. Then we're going to stitch and then we're going to leave tails at the end. So starting at the end, we are going to backstitch on our dart and stitch all the way up to that point. And then what you are going to do is you're going to lift your needle and leave some long tails. Then you are going to take those tails and you are going to knot them two or three times to finish that dart. Never backstitch on the edge of the dart. That creates additional bulk, especially when you're using a lightweight fabric like what is called for in this blouse. Next up, we are going to press our darts downwards. So I'm actually using a pressing ham to help me here. And a little trick when pressing darts, you want to warm up the tip of the dart with the tip of your iron before you actually press the dart over. This will get you a more seamless look on your dart. And so I'm going to repeat that process on the second side here. And then I am just going to lay it flat and I'm going to press a little bit of steam along the edges of that dart just to make sure that it is lying nice and flat. Next thing we're going to do is we're just going to tack this down so it doesn't get in the way when we are stitching later on. If you're confident, you can skip that step. Step four, the inverted box pleat. So we are going to find our center back point by placing our back completely in half and then taking your fabric marker and marking the center back point. And you will have two rows of markings. The inner markings is where the box pleat is formed and you're going to place that box pleat folded in towards the center, thus creating your inverted box pleat. And you're going to bring both of those edges in just like so. And once you have that pinned in place, you are going to baste within that seam allowance. Next, we are going to pop it over to the pressing station and press it. Step five, the ruffle. So this is optional, but of course we had to add it. I stitched along the bottom, the seam allowance here, because that is how much I'm going to want to turn it up. And with the slinky fabric, that is a little trick that will really help you to make sure that you get a nice straight fold. So I'm going to press that and then I am going to go back in and I am going to press it over one more time, creating a narrow double fold hem. And so we're just going to continue to repeat this along the length of our skinny little ruffle here. And once we have that all folded over, I like to pin mine in place just to make sure that nothing shifts, especially when you're doing such a narrow hem. That being said, if you are confident that nothing is going to shift, you could always skip pinning as well. And I like to pin along the length of this, then pop over to the sewing machine and stitch it in place. Next up, we will need to fold in the sides here. So we're just going to do a narrow double fold here. And I didn't actually press this one just because it is such a short seam here. I'm just using some pins and then I'm going to pop on over and stitch it on either side. So do make sure you do both sides because these will be exposed. So next it looks like this. Then we're going to sew two rows of long stitches. So we're going to flip that to five centimeters. And then the next thing that you're going to do is you're going to mark 1.5 centimeters or five eighths of an inch away from each of the edge of your shoulders, because that is where our ruffle is going to stop. It also happens to be our seam allowance. So we are going to pull those gathering stitches to gather up the ruffle and on your center point in your ruffle, you'll go, you are going to match that with the center point of your blouse, marking that center of that inverted box pleat. Then pin the corner piece to where it is supposed to end and then adjust your ruffles as necessary, pinning in between just to set those ruffles so that they lie naturally and you don't have any concentrated in one area too much. Try to keep it as even as possible. And so I'm just fiddling out with this, making sure everything looks just right before I go ahead and add in some of those pins. Then the next thing you are going to do is you are going to head to your sewing machine and you are going to stitch this in place within that seam allowance. So just stitch it right there. Step six is the back yoke. 
So if you're not doing the ruffle, this is where you will start next. So you're going to place your back, your back yoke right sides together, and you're going to match up those notches. So those second set of notches that you had that were wider than those inner ones to create those box pleat, that's what you're matching up right here. And you're just going to pin this all along the top here. And then you're going to take it over to the sewing machine. And now you can stitch this seam using your regular seam allowance of 1.5 centimeters. And so you just really want to make sure that all of the ruffles stay in place and nothing is getting caught. And then I like to serge those edges just to finish it up. So you can see that I've surged the edges here. Next, we are going to press the ruffle down and the seam allowance up towards the top of the yoke on the blouse. And so I'm just using a bit of steam, but when you do that, it does affect your ruffles on the other side. So I am just going over this with my iron just to adjust those ruffles. That being said, after you wash this garment, those ruffles will come out looking perfect every single time. Step seven, the shoulders. So with this, we are going to place our front and our back right sides together at our shoulder seams. I'm just gonna flip it around for you so you can see a bit better. And they do have notches matching up the center of the shoulder seams, which is fantastic, uh, especially if you are a new sewist. And I'm just pinning these in place and then you can head on over to your sewing machine and you can sew them as well as serge the edges or finish them however you would like to finish your edges. Now, next, we are on to step eight and nine, edge finishing and sleeve hems, or in my case, the flounce sleeve expansion. So with this, I have stitched for my narrow hem that quarter of an inch, and then I'm going to press under that quarter of an inch, and then go over and press it again, doing a very narrow double fold hem. Now, I really like to use this method because it ensures that you have a straight narrow hem and you also don't get any of those running puckers that you might get if you hadn't have originally stitched in that quarter of an inch seam allowance. Then we're just going to stitch that in place and then we're going to run two gathering stitches along the top of our ruffle flounce sleeve. And I am just going to gather it just slightly, pulling only on the two bobbin threads on either side. That way it makes it a little bit easier to gather. Next up, we are going to grab our blouse and then we are going to match the notches. So there are two sets of notches on here and you are going to want to match up the shoulder seam with the one notch and then the notch that has the second notch will actually go to the back. So you just really wanna make sure that you have those notches lined up correctly. And then you're just going to adjust those gathers as you see fit going along the flounce sleeve here, creating a gorgeous little ruffle design on this grown on sleeve. And I'm just pinning away that back ruffle just to make sure I don't catch it in the seam allowance here. And this is what it will look like onto step 10, which is the side seams. So we're going to place our blouse right sides together. And then we are going to pin up the side seam. And first I like to match the corner of where our sleeves attach, where that seam is, where we've attached that ruffle. And then I'm going to pin the edges and then I'm just going to go in and pin all the way down. Now you'll also notice that we have a notch if you are doing the blouse version as opposed to the dress and you're going to stitch from that notch up, leaving that bottom section open. And I've also surged the edges here as well, just to finish that off. And so you can see I've got those two ends open there. Now onto step 12, the next facing for the scoop neck version. So with this, we are going to measure four centimeters or 1.5 inches on that shoulder seam here. And you're going to take your neck facing, which is cut on the bias, meaning it does stretch. Do not cut it on the straight of grain. Next, you are going to overlap that. And I've attached my bias on so that it goes to the second dot, but I'm going to start stitching at that first dot. And then I'm going to overlap that facing going over so that it extends over to that first dot. So I have extra fabric there. You don't want it to match up exactly or you won't be able to attach them together. 
Then I am just going to place it in half. So I'm just marking my halfway point here and I'm attaching it to the other side. And then I'm just going to distribute my pins evenly with right sides together, attaching the facing to the top of the neckline here. And once we have that all pinned in place, then you can begin to start stitching, but you want to start stitching at that notch and end at that other notch, leaving that four centimeter gap. So this is what it'll look like. It has that four centimeter gap here. Next, I am folding it over and I'm finding out where my seam ends for that shoulder seam here. And I'm just matching it up on the other side and matching where that shoulder seam ends. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because I want my facing seam and my shoulder seam to match up perfectly. You could just stitch it together, but you wouldn't have perfectly matched seams and we wouldn't want that in our garments. Then I am just matching up those two dots that I drew, pinning them, and then I'm going to take it over to the sewing machine and I'm going to stitch the two ends of the facing together. So this is what it looks like once it is stitched together. Now we need to attach it to the rest of the neckband. Make sure you press open those seams. I'm just finger pressing and then stitch it in place as so, and you can see it matches up perfectly. Next, we are going to reduce the size of our bias binding down to 5 eighths of an inch or 1.5 centimeters. Next, we are going to fold this down onto itself so it meets that seam edge. So I'm just folding my bias binding so it meets where I have stitched and I'm folding it towards the wrong side of my fabric. And once that has all been pressed in place, we're going to fold it one more time and that completely conceals that facing piece. And if you're using a darker fabric, you could get away with doing a very fun contrasting bias binding strip here to create a very unique garment, which has a pretty little element only you can see. So once we are done pressing that in place, because this is cut on a curve and it is a bias, I do like to use pins or clips depending on which you prefer. I find pins to be more secure than clips. And I am just pinning this in place and I'm really being conscious to slightly roll the edge of the top of the blouse towards that wrong side so we don't have any of that bias binding peeking through to the edge even though my fabrics match and you wouldn't really tell, you just need to be careful of that. And once we have this all nicely pinned here, then we're going to go in over at our machine and we are going to stitch all the way around the neck edge, creating that beautiful facing here. And this is what it looks like from the back. Now for step 14 and 15, the hem and side splits. Now the side splits is only on the blouse and that is what we are going to start with today. I am just going to make a little notch here just so that I can freely move that because I had surged the edges. If you didn't surge, you wouldn't have to do that. Next, I am going to create a narrow double fold hem here. Now I am pressing this because it is a bit fiddly rather than just finger pressing it. So you're going to press that narrow folded hem just like so, then take it over and make sure you pin it because it is crucial in ensuring that these lay nicely because they do kind of come to that point at the top. Then you're just going to stitch along this V shape. And when you are done, it should look a little something like this. Nice and neat and all completely contained. Now the next thing we're going to do is the hem and similar to how we did the sleeves, we are going to stitch our quarter of an inch in place so we have that guideline for pressing as well as stabilizing our fabric to ensure that we don't get any ruffles or puckers when we are stitching and folding it over. So we are going to do a double fold hem and you're going to do that on either side. So you're not going to be sewing in a continuous circle because we do have the side splits. So you've got two seams at the bottom that you are going to be hemming up. And once we have this all pressed up, I like to take it and pin it in place just to ensure that nothing moves. Especially if you're going to be wearing this blouse untucked, you wanna make sure that you have a very nice and neat narrow hem. And I am just going on both sides here. And then I will pop on over to my sewing machine and I am going to stitch close to the folded edge of this fabric, going through, finishing up the blouse. And it should look a little something like this once it is all done with a cute little ruffle on the back. And now for the reveal. Ba -dum, ba -dum, bum, bum. 
pam 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 so now that we are all done our sew along i thought i would share with you a couple of ways in which you can style this blouse now if you've got the dress of course, you can style it with or without the belt to give you two totally different looks, which is great for a capsule wardrobe. Now, in terms of the blouse, I decided to pair it two ways. So the first way I thought I would show you is with a tight pencil skirt. So I wanted to balance out the nice flowiness of the sleeves and billowiness of this blouse with a tight bottom. And I think that this is a very sharp look that is very professional and would be great for going out on a date or going to work. And then I thought I would pare it down a little bit and did more of a gathered full skirt, which gives a more casual vibe. You could also pair this with shorts or with trousers for a casual look as well. It is incredibly versatile. One of the things that I really like about this cut of the top is it is incredibly comfortable to wear. It seriously feels like you're barely wearing anything at all. When you lean back in your chair, you don't have any buttons or zippers in the back. So I just find this an incredibly comfortable blouse that I find myself really reaching for again and again in my closet, simply because it is so easy to wear and it looks smart. So there are comfortable clothes that tend to be ones that I wear kind of just around the house that you probably wouldn't want to go over to the shops in, whereas this is incredibly comfortable and and if I were to pop out to go grab groceries, I would feel very put together as I left the house. So I really enjoy that. And in fact, I enjoyed making this so much. I think I am going to make the dress version as well because it is spring and summer and you can never have too many dresses. I would love to hear your thoughts on this. And if you have made this blouse as well, let me know in the comments down below. And until next time, makers, let's get our so-spiration on. Bum, bum, ba -da, ba -da.